we're looking at uh, electric stuff, uh, related to electricity and electromagnetism. Um, the first, one of the most basic concepts of electromagnetism is the idea of charge. Uh, we know that you guys know, I'm sure that there are positive charges and negative charges, and you probably, and I would guess the phrase opposites attract come from, comes from the idea of, of charge. Um, now, different objects have different charges. This paper is neutral because there's about an equal number of protons and electrons in it, uh, so it has no net charge. Um, this little vis a -vis marker also is neutral, so you know if I put the marker near the paper, nothing happens, it's not attracted. Um, but we can transfer charge from one object to another. Uh, some materials hold on to charge more strongly than others. Uh, there's a table on page 655 of your book, uh, and in that table, the items that are further down will hold on to their charges more strongly. Uh, so if you rub them together, rabbit fur is at the top of the table. If you rub the, the rabbit fur on this marker, some charge will transfer onto the marker. And now, if I put it near these, this paper, it's kind of hard to see see on the video. I think you can see it to a little bit, but you can see that the little bits of paper are kind of dragged along by the marker. They are attracted to it. Um, now, why would it be that something with no charge, like this paper, would be attracted to something with a charge? Well, there are charges in these little bits of paper. Uh, there's an equal amount of positive and negative charges, but if something, say, say we have our, our pen, and say it's positively charged, okay? Uh, actually, it would be negatively charged because the, it would take the electrons from the fur. So let's say it's negative, there are negative charges, and we bring it close to this little sheet of paper, and this paper is neutral, but when you bring these negative charges close, the positive charges will move toward those negative charges, and the negative charges will move away. And so it becomes polarized. Since our positive charge is closer, negative charge is further away. And when it's polarized, then it will stick to, to other objects. Uh, that's also what happens, you know, if you rub a balloon on your head, you know, your hair will stand up uh, when, you, when you pull the balloon away. It's because charge is being transferred, and then uh, your hair different strands of hair have the same charge, and so they repel each other. That's what causes your, your hair to be uh, to stand up. Um, charge conservation is one of the fundamental uh, conservation laws. Charge is conservation. That makes sense. Charge is conserved. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> um, we've already talked about many of the conservation laws. Energy is conserved. Momentum. Uh, there are some other things. Angular momentum. Charge is one of those things that are conserved. I believe there are seven conservation laws altogether. Um, anyway, but charge cannot be created uh, nor destroyed. Um, as you guys know, there are two charge carrying particles that make up atoms, make, that make up matter. There's electrons and the protons. Uh, the electron charge, electron has a charge of minus 1.60 times 10 to the minus 19 coulombs. Uh, C is coulomb. And it is the unit of charge. It is a fundamentally, well, actually, they call current a fundamental unit, even though it's current coulombs per second. I don't understand that. Anyway, charge is measured in coulombs. Proton has the same charge but it's positive. Uh, and this is given by the constant E for the electron charge. This is not 2.71 whatever. This is not emissivity. Uh, yeah. So the E is defined to be the positive 1.6, so minus E is the electron charge, and plus E is the, the proton charge. Okay. Um, in your book, in the tables in the, I think it's in the, in, inside the back cover, um, it gives the masses of protons and neutrons and, and whatnot. Uh, 
which will be you'll need to answer some of your to do, solve some of your problems. Uh, as you guys know, the proton and neutron have about the same mass, so the neutron's a little bit uh, bigger or more massive, I should say, and electron mass is much smaller than uh, the other two. Now, because electrons and protons are the particles that make up normal matter, charge is always found in multiples of the electron charge. Okay, so you can't have a charge, you can't get a charge naturally of 2 times 10 to the minus 19th coulombs. It has to be in multiples of 1.6. The term for that is that charge is quantized, meaning it comes in distinct quantities. Uh, there was an experiment done by a guy named Milliken that, where he showed that charge was quantized. Uh, it involved watching charged particles float up and down in oil drops. And uh, I, we had to do that experiment in college. It was very tedious. Uh, Anyway, but charge is always found in multiples of the electron charge. So if something has, you know, if if you're told that something has a charge of 4.8 uh, microcoulombs, uh, micro is a prefix that you'll see a lot in this uh, this chapter. Micro means 10 to the minus six. Uh, also, for the record, nano will show up. That's 10 to the minus ninth. That's a one, one nanocoulomb. Anyway, so if you have uh, 4.8 times 10 to the minus 6 coulombs, and the question is how many uh, electrons is it missing? You know, you just take the whatever charge you have and divide by the electron charge. So that's going to be 3, and then times 10 to the 13th, I guess. So there are 3 times 10 to the 13th uh, excess protons in this charge. Uh, yeah, so that's some of the problems you'll you'll be doing will will involve that. Um, ten to the minus nineteenth is pretty small. Uh, so you, you usually don't see charges of like a coulomb. Generally you see them on the order of, of micro coulombs. Uh, and gener and Objects that you see on a normal basis have a lot of charges in there, but they're balanced. They're the same number of electrons and protons, and so most objects you see are uh, electrically neutral. They don't have a, a net charge. Um, and though, I, as I said, most charges you'll see are in on the order of microcoulombs, uh, you can have more lightning bolts typically transfer 20 to 30 coulombs of charge, so they they do a, a lot of they move a lot of charge around. Um, there are two types of substances: conductors and insulators. So named for how charge responds to them. Conductors allow charge to flow freely. Uh, many metals are conductors, like copper. Uh, yeah, and ge generally conductors are metals. Uh, insulators do not, don't allow charge to flow freely. And things that are insulators are like rubber, uh, most plastics and so forth. Uh, water is a conductor. It's important to know. You know, if it storms and you're swimming, you should get out of the water because you could get electrocuted. Uh, and if it storms, you know, and there's thunder and lightning, you're safe in your car because even though the exterior of the car is metal and it'll conduct, the uh, tires are rubber and it grounds out the, the charge and you're, you're safe. Um, and I, we mentioned... Uh, we talked about thermal conductors and insulators, and as I said then, many thermal conductors are also thermal insulators and, or sorry, many thermal conductors are also electric conductors and many thermal insulators are also electric insulators, but it's not necessarily, uh, they're not necessarily, uh, that's not always the case. Uh, wood is also an 
insulator. Now, conductors allow charge to flow freely. It doesn't mean insulators can't acquire a charge. It just means that once it charges on an insulator, it doesn't move around. You get charge on a conductor and it'll spread itself out, even itself out. If you attach it to something else, charge will flow out of it on, into a wire or whatever, but insulator will just, you know, the charges won't move around uh, in a perfect insulator, of course. Um, then there are also semiconductors, which are in between. And some semiconductors, uh, depending on the conditions, can act as conductors or insulators. And those turn out to be very useful in electronic devices. Uh, silicon is, is used in computers uh, because it is a semiconductor and it allows charge to flow or not flow depending on, you know, certain circumstances. And that's in a, a circuit that's complex like a computer. Sometimes you want the, the charge to flow and sometimes you don't. Um, one interesting application of this is something called a photoconductor. A photoconductor acts as a, is a semiconductor. It acts as a conductor in the light and insulator in the dark. Uh, and that's how copiers work. Uh, the, the light hits this positively charged photoconducting material. Uh, and so the, the charge will just kind of flow away because it's positive. It has a net charge and the light has made it a, a conductor. And then the dark areas will keep the charge because they're still insulators, so charge is not free to flow. And then there's toner in the copier that they, they goes on in a layer, and the toner is negatively charged, and so it adheres to those positively charged dark areas. And then the, the what's called the drum, uh, it's the thing where the, the toner is applied, and then the drum is pressed against the, the paper and wherever the dark areas were, then it has, it has toner and so you know, it prints onto the paper and the light areas don't. And that's how, you, how uh, copiers generally work.